Hallelujah. Are you ready for the word of God? Don't let somebody say, get ready. Because you are about to change. The Bible says that the word of God is so powerful that it can change us. Amen. It is it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides into the uh, dividing and sunder of spirit and soul. So I'm not going to be fast. I'm going to try to be slow, but I'm going to try to put in as much as I can. We already had a, a good word from Pastor Bridget. Can you just rejoice? Hallelujah. Uh, this is part two, which is the main message. Today I want to speak about living inside out. Living inside out. You know, we have some children. I try not to tell how many children we have all the time because sometimes when I, st when I mention it, some people stop listening to the rest of the message. So <laughs> I'm going to stop that for now. Praise God. Suffice to say we have many children. Praise God. Hallelujah. And I realize that in the PG schools, they have all kinds of days. They have what they call pajama days. Some of those days are dangerous, praise God. <laughs> and they all have to wear pajamas to school. And then they have what they call inside out day. They have to wear their clothes inside. I don't know where that came from, but it probably influenced my message this morning, praise God. And I've seen them wear their clothes inside out. But today I'm talking about living inside out. Inside out. And I believe that we will be transformed. Let's go to Proverbs chapter number 20. The Lord said to me that this is a year of wisdom for soul winning. So every service, both Wednesday and Sunday, is going to be like wisdom school. So come to somebody and say, welcome to wisdom school. Amen. If you stay long enough in wisdom school, what will happen? You become wise. You'll be full of wisdom. And if you are wise, what happens to you? What are some of the benefits of wisdom? Just, just shout it out from there. Like what? Well, well. Rich, wise people become rich. Praise God. How many of us like to be richer than we already are? I know some people don't think we should talk about money in church, but the Bible tells us a lot about money. The Bible says Solomon was the wisest man, and he was also the what? Richest man. The Bible says in the days of Solomon that gold and silver were like stones. So children were playing with gold on the street. That's how rich. So it was not just Solomon that was rich. The whole nation was rich. And God can do the same thing today. What else about the other benefits of wisdom? Protection. If you know, if you are wise, you will know how to be secure. That's and I say amen. Right. It takes wisdom to lock your doors when you are going to bed. <laughs> Some leave their doors open and wonder why somebody got in and stole their stuff. And not only just physical stuff, some of the kind of uh, uh, stealing we have today is intellectual thieves. So you have to know how to pro protect your stuff. It takes wisdom. It takes wisdom. And many times, those who are wise take precautions that people who are not so wise don't take. Right? I said right? Yeah. I remember when I was a teenager, myself and my friend, Pastor Pella, we, need, we used to do, take some unnecessary risk. One day, he came back, and there, he was driving a car, and on his bumper, there were two steps. You could climb it to the top. So what happened? He drove under a trailer. A trailer. Thank God he wasn't driving too fast, so he just bumped it and gave it two steps. I said, how come? He said his brakes had been going out for a while, but he didn't have the time or the disposition to fix it. And he didn't have enough money to invest. Now he had to spend more money fixing the car and fixing the brakes. 
So it's wiser to fix your brakes early. Praise God. So wisdom is important for protection. If he was, if he was driving as fast as he usually drives, he wouldn't be here today. Yeah, I've, I've, I've been the fastest on the road driving with my friend, Pastor Fella. He drives, he used to drive very fast. But he's wise that today. <laughs> now he's married, he has children. Before he got married, or when, just around when, just before he got married, his wife used to tell me then, his fiance, uh, please, when we are going out, could you drive and not let Pastor Pella drive? <laughs> now, many of you know him, if you, if you come here. He's very quiet now, but he was not like that before. And why am I saying all of this is that wisdom is important. As you grow older, you're supposed to grow wiser. But it's not always the case. There's an adage that says a fool at 40 is a fool forever. I don't agree with it, though. Praise God. <laughs> not everything they say there is true. So let's go to the scriptures. Proverbs chapter number 20. Uh, let's start from verse 3. I'll be reading more of the NIV, the New International Version. And if I need the King James, I'll let you know. He said, it is one's honor to avoid strife, but every fool is quick to quarrel. So if somebody is quick to quarrel, what does that tell you? It's not so wise. I don't use the word fool because the Bible says don't call anybody fool. I just call them dumb dumb. Praise God. <laughs> the Bible doesn't say if you call somebody dumb dumb, you go to hell. <laughs> so I just I, I make sure I don't call them fools. People say it doesn't matter. Words are important in scriptures. <laughs> All right, let's continue. Next verse. Sluggards do not plow in season, so at harvest they, are, they look but find nothing. So somebody who is looking for something in time of harvest and don't find it, it's because the Bible says he's what? He's a slugger. What's a slugger? Very slow. He doesn't know when to sow, and he doesn't know when to reap. Verse 5. This is the key verse. The purpose of a man's heart are deep, are, are, are deep waters, but one who has insight we draw them out. That means that the, 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 the purpose of a man's life is hidden deep within him, but it takes a man of understanding to what? To draw it out, to bring it out, to bring it out. So I'm, talking, I'm teaching about living inside out, living according to what is inside and drawing it out. Drawing it out. The King James sounds like, it says something like the counsel of a man is like deep waters and a man of understanding draws it out. So your future is not ahead of you. Where's your future? It's inside of you. So what are you going to have to do about your future? You're going to have to draw it out. You're going to have to draw it out. So I'm talking about how to live inside out. How to live according to the expectations, the qualities of the inward man. If you read the scripture, and I won't take time to read all the verses. I'm sure you can go search it. The Bible tells us that man is made up of three parts, the spirit, the soul, and the body. The spirit is the inward man. It's the real person. The soul is in between. The soul is the middle man. In between the spirit and the body. And your soul can either be spiritual if it is focused on the things of the spirit or it can be carnal or physical if it is focused on the things on the external. So man again is made up of three parts. Find that in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 23 I believe. It says, may your spirit, soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the spirit is the real person. Tell somebody, your spirit is the real you. Say it again, your spirit is the real you. Amen. The soul is in between. The soul is spiritual too. And then the body is the external suit that we wear. Now I'm saying this, somebody's giving a thanksgiving 
Uh, one of our members just passed on to be with the Lord. Sometimes people really get concerned when people pass on, and some, you know, cry, they lament, they feel, we can never see him again. He's all gone. And I know that this is natural. This is natural. There's pain when somebody travels or leaves or, you know, changes location. But you must recognize that the body is not the real person. The body is more like the clothes that we wear. When people go into space, because of the impact of sin, they have to wear space suits. You say, why did that include impact of sin? Jesus went into space. He wasn't wearing any what? Space suit. So the natural man is supposed to be able to do that. But now, we have to depend on oxygen. Praise God. Praise the Lord. So the real person is the spirit person. We don't often see the spirit of a man because it takes spiritual eyes to see. But some people can. Some people can see angel. Some people can see demons. Some people can look at a man and tell if this man is a good person or a bad person without having done anything. It's called the gifts of discerning of spirit. You can discern human spirit. You can tell somebody if the person is a crook or not a crook just by looking at him from spiritual eyes. As he had one of the ministers, I think it was J.C. Duplantis, who was interviewing for an interview one time, and this, this person had come, had all the credentials, the best credentials of the sport. And as he was interviewing this person, he was getting convinced this is the right person for the job. All the T crossed, all the I's dotted, and he, you know, with all the right experience. And as he was doing that, the wife was passing, stopped, walked towards the back, listened for a few minutes, and shook his, her head and was like, no, no, no. He was thinking, she doesn't even know the guy. I mean, he, she's not looking at the credentials that I'm looking at. How come she's saying not the right person? What was she looking at? The spirit. She was looking beyond the external to the inward man. The inward man. In short, the Bible says God looks at the heart. When the Bible talks about the heart, it's not talking about the blood pumping organ. Your heart is not different from your liver, praise God, biologically, in the sense that they are just natural things. But when God looks at the heart, there is a good heart, and there is a man or a woman that's heart may be wrong. And the conditions of the heart is more important than the conditions of your face. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. That's what the Bible tells us in Peter, that women, if they are, want to get themselves beautiful, should not only look nice on the outside. Say amen. amen. Now, it's not saying don't look nice on the outside. Amen. Some people say that means don't wear perfume, don't wear makeup, don't make your hair. Now, that's, that's not God's teaching. God wants us to look the best. Amen. Just don't overdo it. Praise God now. Amen. Let me come back to the word of God. Amen. All right, so the inward man is more important. So in, in 1 Peter 3, the Bible said, let your beauty not be of the outward appearance, but of the inward man. And it tells us what makes the inward man beautiful. He said, a meek, which is humble, and quiet spirit, which in the sight of God is of great price. That means somebody who is a talkative, who is easy to get offended, who is, who is rash and harsh, does not look beautiful spiritually. But a meek person, meek means humble, it is, he is, follows proper order. Somebody say hallelujah. The Bible says he's a man of beautiful spirit. Let's go to Matthew chapter number 12. Don't worry, I'm not going to keep it too long. Just one long, praise God. I know that not everybody is used to our kind of service, so I'm going to do as I'm led. And the Holy Ghost knows who is here more than I do. Matthew chapter number 12, let's start from verse 33. It says here, and I'm reading the NIV, it says, make a tree good and the fruit will be good, or make a tree bad and the fruit will be bad. 
For a tree is recognized by its fruit. He said, you brood of vipers, how can you that are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Verse 35. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. So where does good things come from? From the inside. Where does evil things come from? Put it up in the, in the King James. King James is my favorite translation, but not everybody understands King James language, so I try to read other translations as well. Amen. The Bible says that a good man, out of the good treasure, that means that everybody has a treasure chest on the inside. Unfortunately, some people's treasure chests are full of corrupt things. Why some people have a treasure chest that is full of good things. So when good things are coming out, either from the mouth or through the action, it's not just the external that is a problem. There is something inside that is wrong. The same thing, when good things are coming out from someone, somebody is saying nice things, living a nice life, treating people well, there is a, there is a, there is a treasure of good things on the inside. So if you want to change somebody, how, do you end up, how can you change the person properly? You have to change the person from the inside out. And that's why many times when people come to church, they hear things like, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, don't tell lies, don't commit fornication. We know the law, we know the things that are good. But they go out of church and they want to do the right thing but they see themselves doing the wrong things. And sometimes, you know, they get mad at themselves. They take new res resolutions. Some go into some physical, you know, trying to curtail the wrong. But they see themselves doing it over and over and over and over again. That's what is called behavior modification. People are trying to change from the outside. And I know many times also parents, if you have children, oftentimes you want to make them live right. So you, you set laws, you set conditions, you try to put pressure on them to do the right thing. Now there's a place for all of that. But the Bible is telling us here that the man's life and character and his future is not coming from the external. There's something inside that is motivating people to do things that they do. So it is from the treasure that is stored in the inside that determines what the person does on the outside. So if you really want to change somebody, what do you have to do? You have to try to change the person from inside out. Inside out. And that's why we understand when the Bible tells us that when God created man, he created man in his own image and in his own likeness. When Adam sinned, something happened. The nature inside was changed. And because of that change in nature, his character began to change. And his lifestyle began to change. And that's why we have so much problems today. You know, today if you ask most people, they will tell you that everybody is a sinner. And that's the reason we all sin. But the Bible differs in the new covenant. The Bible says that when we are born again, it says we become new creatures. It says that the old man is gone. The nature of sin is removed. That means that you are no longer a sinner when you are born again. The nature of sin that the old Adam had is taken away. Before we get born again, we all were sinners. We all had a treasure chest with evil things. Even when we want to do good, the Bible says evil is present. But once you're born again, the Bible says that the old nature is removed. The old nature is removed. We become new creatures. We become born again, recreated after God in true righteousness and holiness. I'm saying this because if a man thinks he is a sinner, what's going to happen to him? 
He will continue to sin. He will say, we all are like that. Nobody can help it. You sin, I sin. Why do you try to condemn me? We are all sinners. If you think like that, you're thinking wrong. Because the Bible says once we are born again Christians, our nature is removed. There is a new heart. He said, I will take away the old heart and I will give you a new heart. A heart that is recreated after God in true righteousness and holiness. I know the question that people ask thereof is then if that is the case, how come many Christians still live in sin? If you look at some Christians' lives, you can't you can differentiate it from an unbeliever. They like the same things unbelievers like. They talk the same way unbelievers talk. They, they suffer the same way unbelievers suffer. There's no difference. The Bible tells us exactly what the reason is. If you look at Galatians 4, it says once a child... He's, like, he's, he's still a, an infant. He has not changed. He has not grown. He said he's no different from a servant. He's operating like a servant even though he's a son. And even though a man is born again, if he does not change his soul, his mind, he will look like someone who is not born again even though he's born again. And that's where my message really lies this morning. Let's go to Romans chapter number 12. So I started by saying man is three parts. Who can remember the parts? One, spirit, spirit two, soul, and three what? Body. If your soul is, is only concerned, now let me, let me make it a little clearer. The spirit is the inward man. You can't see the spirit of a man. You never really can with your natural eyes except you have your spiritual eyes open. The soul is the middle man. The soul contains our intellect, our imaginations, and our emotions. These are part of our soul. Our body is our earth suit. It's where we live in. Like someone going to space wearing an earth suit. Now, if he comes back, he puts the earth suit down and, and lives in his normal clothes. The same thing when a man dies on earth, he puts the body down. But the person is not dead. The person just takes in a different kind of body, clothing, and goes into eternity. Somebody say, hallelujah. hallelujah. Some people say, will you recognize one another when you are in heaven? Of course. The body, the spiritual body, is just like the physical body. It's the spirit that gives entity to the body. The spirit is the real man. Glory to God. Now, for us to function externally, we need a soul. And the soul is the middle part. The soul is the one that computes our decisions and helps us carry them out. The Bible is telling us where we are going to read. I'm not just going to spend a little more time here. Is that if you are going to walk in wisdom and transform your life, you're going to have to change the way you think. Your soul has to be reprogrammed. Because when Adam sinned, and sin passed to all men, the soul of a man was now programmed to walk according to his feelings. So he was living from the outside in. He judged things by the way they looked. If somebody says, you stupid fool, what does a natural man do? Cause them out too. Why? Because... He gets mad by what he hears, what he feels. If they said the economy is going down, what does a natural man do? Becomes afraid, begins to panic. Why? Because he looks at everything. If, the, if there is a statistic that says 99% of the people are catching a particular disease, what does a natural man do? He begins to get afraid because he's living from the outside in. His decisions are made by what's happening around him. But once we are born again, our nature is changed. We don't live outside in. We live, I want you to say it louder. We live how? Is inside out. Our decisions, our choices are not made by the things we see on the outside. Our decisions and our choices are made by the things that are walking in the realm of the spirit that natural men can see. Glory to God. And it's going to take a reprogramming of our mind. Romans chapter number 12 from verse 1. Glory to God. 
Just continue with the King James. He said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove that which is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Verse 3. For I say unto you through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according to the, to, to, as according as God had dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now these three verses are very powerful. I want to encourage you to go back and read it over and over again, different translations, meditate on it. Because these are keys to changing our lives. He said, first of all, I command, I, I beseech you, I'm telling you, your body, you should present it unto God as a living sacrifice, which means that you have to learn to control your body. Don't let your body control you. Come to somebody say, don't let your body control you. Say, you have to learn to control your body. Amen. God gave us bodies. God gave us feelings. But it cannot control you. If you let your body control you, soon enough, you will be overweight. Why? Because your body wants to eat everything most of the time. It wants to eat sugar, sugary things, fatty things, things that are not healthy. And most of these things themselves are not wrong. It's just the quantity we eat. Glory to God. I was surprised when, I, when we traveled to U Europe, many of the fast foods that we have here, the sizes that they sell of the same food in Europe is smaller. McDonald's burgers are smaller in Europe than in the U.S. Which one is better, the smaller or the bigger? <laughs> we say, what? I want all I can for my money. Why will you give me small burgers? <laughs> You spend your money, buy the big burger, then you go and spend your money, try to lose the weight at the gym after you have eaten the big burger. It doesn't make sense. Now, thank God for most of this fast food, they have cut out the super size. You say super size, if they get a whole liter of soda, a big... A whole... <laughs> a whole leg of cow... <laughs> And a big bun to go with it. <laughs> and then they get surprised why they're slow to move. And then they have to go and pay a doctor to tell them to lose weight. Wisdom is a defense. Do you know that if you're eating too much, your spirit will tell you? You tell you stuff. You don't need, you don't need that super size. You don't even need the fries. Just get, just get the sandwich. Somebody say hallelujah. <laughs> but you say, but you no, know, the flesh. You say, but are you going to starve me today? We always have the fries <laughs> and 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 the, and the cookie and cream milkshake to go with it. <laughs> but we have to learn to live how inside out. The spirit will say, that's enough. Stop that. Why do a lot of people quarrel? Many times when you want to open your mouth to respond, what does your spirit tell you? Stop. Shut up. Let him go away with you. Say, I can't let him get away. He just called me a name. You think I'm, I'm just a mark to be stepped. It's your flesh that is talking. The spirit says, don't worry. I, vengeance is mine. I'll take care of you. Let him go. But the flesh says, no! We're going to have a fit here. <laughs> and after fighting and tearing fighting and struggling and making all kinds of stuff, they try to repent days later. But the Bible tells us that we can live differently. I say, hallelujah! hallelujah. We can change by the renewing of our minds. Now, again, time is of essence, so I'm going to try to make it as quick as possible. You know, when, when people think about the mind, oftentimes they just think about, oh, just... Your thoughts, everybody thinks, you know, you can't really control it. Thoughts just come through and out of our minds. But if we begin to read the scripture, we discover that it is not so. 
that we have the ability from God's word and by the spirit to determine what we think and how we think. In short, some of the most important lessons you can learn is how to control your thoughts. Because the Bible tells us it's out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. That the treasures that are in the inward, that means that the inward man is not just the spirit. The inward man is the spirit and the soul. When a man leaves his body, he leaves his body behind. His soul and spirit is what ascends and goes to heaven. And where, you, where your spirit goes, oftentimes is determined by the choices you make in your will. So your spirit and your soul are very closely related. And in short, if we begin to understand thinking, one part of thinking is the word imagination. The word imagination is a big word. I know people don't think much of it, but this is wisdom school. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Imagination is the part of your soul where you create images and thoughts. That is the creative part of every human being. The ability to imagine. To see things before it's external. And I'm talking about pictures. You can, you can see them in your inward being. Your imagination is, is the bed place of your vision and your future. In short, if you cannot imagine it, you can never have it. And so the enemy works very hard to trap people's imagination. Glory to God. I said glory to God. I want to hear it louder. I say glory to God. Again, this is things that you spend some time to, to study. If we read Genesis 1, the Bible says God created man in his own word, image and likeness. What's the meaning of the word image? Something that looks like the real thing. You know, I've studied that over and over, but recently I'm beginning to see it much clearer. God created man in his own image and in his own likeness. For something to become like something else, usually the first thing is to create an image of it, and from that image, create a likeness of it. Interesting. If an architect wants to build a house, he talks to the owner, or if it's his own house, and what does he create first? An image of the house, and then from the image of the house, it now creates a likeness that looks like what he saw. But usually, the process of creation starts with imagery. You have to see it in the unseen first before it becomes manifested in the scene. And if the image is distorted, what happens to what is created? It becomes distorted because it always comes from the image. And what the enemy has done over the years is to give people a wrong image of God and a wrong image of of themselves. That means that they keep reproducing the image that they have. Wow. Why do you think people who grow up in rich neighborhoods, their parents are rich, their friends are rich, they go to rich schools, what usually happens to them most of the time? They become rich. Why? Because of the image that they have. Now, the people who grew up in the wrong neighborhood or the poor neighborhood, their friends are poor, their family are poor, the people they know they are poor, the people that they, that the people that they, that they know and the people those people know are poor. Two generations of poverty. What happens? They have an image of what? Poverty. And because of the image that they have, they can only reproduce from that image. So if you want to change a man's life, you can't do it externally. If you give a poor man money, what happens after a while? He will lose the money and stay poor. I'll come and ask for you again. Ask from you again. But if you can change the way they think, 
if you can replace the poor image with a rich image, they begin to see themselves differently and they begin to act differently because the image anybody has on the inside is what determines what they produce on the outside. Glory to God. So if you, have, if, you are, if you have financial challenges and you're poor and you want to be rich, what are you going to have to do? You're going to have to change the image. Change the image. Don't worry, I'm not distracted. Uh, this is a ministry. We minister to every kind of person. Amen. And we have plenty of children, like I said at the beginning. So I, I understand how children can be. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're not sounding like you are. You change your image. Hey! <laughs> Let me ask you this question again. Why are people depressed? The reason why people are depressed is that they have a negative image about themselves on the inside. Something nobody cares about me. Nobody loves me. Nobody wants to help me. Everybody, everybody hates me. When I come, they look at me like I'm not, I'm not below. Even if everybody's smiling and they have a negative image, what's going to happen? They are going to operate from that image. That's the same reason many times, even in marriages, the husband says, I love you on to Jupiter and back. And then the wife says, yeah, right. And you say, I love you, I love you. I bought this for you. And but. If you don't change the image, if you see yourself as somebody that is not loved, you will operate like someone that is not loved. But let me ask you this, the same thing. What about if the husband does not love the wife, but the wife believes the husband loves her? What happens? She will be joyful. Glory to God. I said glory to God. She was just, she, she was like, my husband is the best. It could be the other way. My wife is the best. She doesn't cook for him. You say, oh, you know why she doesn't cook? She's so smart. She's looking for money so that we can go and eat out. <laughs> she, he, she will give her, herself a, a reason because she's operating from where? The inside out. So the Bible says, be it unto you according to your faith. Your experience is not determined by what is happening around you. Your experiences are determined by what is happening inside of you. If you can change the environment on the inside, you will see things differently in life. One reason why people don't see opportunities to make business is because they have not begun to think like a businessman. They are still thinking like a regular employee, nine to five. If you change the way you think, you begin to see things differently. I deserve a bigger amen than that. Yeah. Then talk about God. God deserves a much bigger one. Yeah. The Bible says, make the tree good. And what will happen to the fruit? The fruits will be good. If you can change what you are thinking on the inside, what will happen to what's coming out? Good stuff. If what is external determines what comes out of you, you're living outside in. That's why when Jesus Christ came, he didn't come to necessarily force people to obey the law. He was not about behavioral modification. Those ones would take care of himself. He came to change the hearts of men. So that once he makes the tree good, what will happen to what comes out of it? It begins to bring good stuff. The Bible says a good man out of the good treasures that is stored in his heart, brings forth good things. Somebody say hallelujah. But this morning as I'm running up, I want to begin to help us how to change the image that we have on our, in, our, in our hearts. Wisdom, I have different definitions of wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to think the right things, speak the right things, and do the right things. I repeat, wisdom is the ability to think the right thoughts. And many times that's where the fight is. The Bible says, fight the good fight of faith, lay holds on eternal life. The Christian fight is not an external fight, it's an internal fight. 
The devil says, you can't make it. You are sick. You are going to die. And there's all of these feelings are coming. There's pain in your leg. There's pain in your back. And you are feeling it. And then there's a physical report that says, this is a, this is a death sentence. There is no cure for this. Then the Bible says, by his stripes, what? You were healed. He by himself bore on his body all our sins and on his sickness on his body. Now we have a choice. We can choose to live outside in by looking at the, the, the report, looking at the symptoms, checking our body how we feel, or we can begin to live inside out by declaring what God has said, believing what God has said, even though it is contrary to what we see. God said to Abraham, I've made you a father of many nations. He looked at his wife. How old are you? It's 90. Abraham, how old are you? Say 100. See, if God wanted to do it, why didn't he do it when we were 25 and 28? Or 25 and 35? Now we are 99 years old. The gynecologist says, no way no way. <laughs> no way. <laughs> it's too late. The Bible says Abraham did not look at his physical body. He had the choice. He could, he could consider himself and say, it's not possible. I can't do this. He did not consider the deadness of Sarah's womb. He refused to walk by sight. Instead, he turned to God's word and even though there was no physical evidence, he believed. The Bible says, against all hope, Abraham believed in hope. So it was not just because God said it. It was because Abraham believed it. He changed his mental picture of himself. And God helped him. God said, let me help you do this. First of all, come out. Count the stars. Look up. Stop looking down. Look up. Look up. Look up. As the stars are so should your children be. Then God changed his name and said, you should no longer be called Abraham, but you should be called what? Abraham. When he called himself Abraham, what was he saying? I am the father of many nations. And if you keep hearing yourself say that over and over, what happens? It begins to create a new picture in your mind. And when Abraham said it, not too long after that, he began to see himself as the father of many nations. How did he introduce himself? What's your name? He says, I'm what? I'm the father of many nations. People say, many nations? That's an interesting name. How many children do you have? He said, don't worry, it's coming. Glory to God. So he had to live from the inside out. And this is the struggle many people have. Many want to live by what they see. They want to live by the way they feel. Somebody offends them from the outside, and they respond from the external. We're going to have to change the way we live. We're going to have to live from the inside out. And how do we change the image we have? The first thing is to study. 2 Timothy chapter number 2, verse 15, he said, Study to show yourself approved of God, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So take time to study. One of the pillars of wisdom that we will study is information. Glory to God. Glory. Knowledge is key to many things. The right kind of knowledge. Information is a type of knowledge, but there are different kinds of knowledge. There's revelation knowledge. Revelation knowledge is a knowledge that is revealed to you. It's not just information, because you can have information and you cannot see inside the information. The Holy Ghost can open it up and you can see what other people can see. There is also what is called experiential knowledge. By experience, and it's not just only physical experience, the Holy Ghost can help you experience things that you did not experience physically. Paul said, I know a man, if he's in his body or out of his body, I don't know. He was caught up in the third heavens. He had an experience, and it's not just because he went there physically or he doesn't really know, but because there was an, a revelation that gave him an experience. Glory to God. And God wants us to begin to operate in that. So the first thing is to study. Spend time to study. The second thing is to meditate. And this is one of the areas I've been spending time on. Meditation means begin to create mental pictures of what the Bible says or who the Bible says you are. Glory to God. In short, this is where most of the change takes place. 
Meditation means you take the word of God and use it to create mental pictures. In short, the Bible tells us that when the Holy Ghost comes, one of the first things he will do is that people will be able to see visions and dream dreams. What are visions and dreams? They're pictures. They're imaginations. They're they are, they are vivid uh, are pictures of what the Holy Ghost wants to do. And meditation means that you take the word of God and stay on it until you can see yourself that way. Listen, if you are sick in your body, maybe you are going through a physical ailment and the doctors have given wrong, uh, you know, negative, negative uh, uh, diagnosis and you want to see yourself healed. It's not enough to just say, God, heal me. Beg God to heal me. God, heal me. And people are waiting when God does it. No, one of the ways to receive the healing, because the Bible says we were already healed, is to take the word of God, sit down on your lazy chair. That's the only time you use that lazy chair. Praise God. And then begin to, begin to see yourself healed. You say, why did I say that's the only time? You're not supposed to be lazy. So you shouldn't even have a lazy chair in your house. Amen. Glory, glory to God. Except for meditate. You sit down and begin to see yourself do what you couldn't do before. If you are poor and your, your finances are, 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 are weak, what should you do? Answer now. This is an interactive church. You sit down on your lazy chair and what? Meditate and begin to do what? See yourself rich. See yourself very rich. And if you see it well enough, when you come out of your meditation, and somebody asks you a question about finances, how are you going to answer? Like a rich man. Because you have seen yourself that way. Listen, your future and your life cannot change except you first see it first. People want to see it externally before they know it has changed. No, it's the other way around. You have to see it inside before it changes on the outside. If you are single and you want to get married, what do you have to do? Get yourself on your what? Lazy chair or, <laughs> or your bed and begin to see yourself married. See yourself with children. Glory to God. Imagine when you have to have to get a minivan. Hallelujah. Some people are not answering. <laughs> Instead of a sports car, I can only take two people. Now, you may need that once in a while when you are growing up. But if you have children, you're going to have to be meditating differently. You're going to have to see yourself in a different way. And if you can see it in your heart, the Bible says it can come to pass. It, you can have exceedingly abundantly above what you ask or what? Imagine. 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 The word imagination is also akin, very close to the word hope. The Bible says that faith is the word substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So where does faith start from? Faith starts from hope. If there is no vision, there is no hope, no matter how much faith you have, there will be nothing for faith to produce. And the reason why people say, I believe the word of God, the word of God is true, and there is no result, is because they have not given faith a picture of what they want. They can't see themselves rich. They can't see themselves living in divine health. They can't see themselves enjoying life. They can't see themselves preaching the gospel around the world. They can't see themselves doing things that other people can't do. And if you can't see it first, your faith cannot bring it to pass. I said for my wife, we travel around the world preaching the gospel. It's not by chance. I've given this testimony many times. When we got into this country, even before we got into this country, we, we began to say we're going to preach the gospel around the world. We saw ourselves preaching around the world. We didn't have no money. At that time, we didn't even have a passport to get out of Africa. But we were ready to preach the gospel. We could see it. When I got to the U.S., I will put the, 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 the map of Europe on the floor in my office. I will begin to see myself in Spain. I close my eyes and say, thank you, Lord, I received Spain in Jesus' name. And I would step on, on United Kingdom and I will step on Italy. If you saw me there, you wonder, what is this guy doing? He's lost his mind. But every, every nation I've stepped in, in my office, I've stepped now in, in, in natural. I don't know which one, which, when, which one happened, but I know I've gone to all the countries. Now, what I've done is that I've taken the map of the world. 
When I'm praying in my office now, I have the map of the world in my hand. Somebody say hallelujah. And I put my hand in, in Asia, put my hand in South America, and put my hand in Europe. Because I have to see myself ministering to the whole world. It doesn't just happen by chance. Everything happens by faith. You have to live from the inside out. If you can see it on the inside, it can come out on the outside. You can see yourself living in divine health. Many of you who hang around with me hear me say it all the time. I will never be sick another day in my life. I'm not just saying it. I've sat down on my active chair. Praise God, I don't have no lazy chair. And I've seen myself walking in divine health every day. Every day. I don't get sick. It doesn't matter what, what kind of pandemic is out there. I, I can't see myself sick. What about you? Is this, is this strong with I said, what about you? The Bible says, out of the abundance of the word, the heart, the mouth speaks. Let me put it this way. If you can't say it in your mouth, you have not seen it in your heart. If you can't say, I will never be sick, you have not seen yourself in divine health. If you can't say, I will never be poor, it means you have never really seen yourself rich. Because if you have it in your heart in full, it will come out of your mouth. And some people just try to say it without having seen it. They copy it because pastor is saying it. It doesn't always work that way. You have to see it, and then you say it. Then it will come to pass. So meditation is changing the way you think. Let's go back to our last verse again where we read Romans chapter number 12, uh, verse 3, and I'll begin to round up with this. Verse 3, Romans 12. It says, Therefore I say unto the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God had dealt to every Man, the measure of faith. You know, in reading this, you wonder, what does it mean? Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Most people reading this only think about one side of pride. There are two sides of pride. Glory to God. So if you are wondering where this message feels in the pillars of wisdom, I'll tell you, it's in humility. Bible humility is not thinking low. Bible humility is thinking according to what the word of God says. If you think higher, it's pride. If you think lower, it's pride. So there are two sides of pride. He said every man should think, should not think more highly than he ought to think. The first thing he's telling you there, you are supposed to think highly. Don't somebody say, think highly of yourself. Say it again, think highly. think highly. Say it one more time. Say, the Bible says, think highly of yourself. He said, don't think more highly than you ought to think. You ought to think highly, but not more highly than you ought to think. He said, but think according to the faith that is given you. So you have to think within the parameters of the word of God. If God says you are healed and you think sick, that's pride. I personally have come to realize that many times thinking less than what God says is the most common expression of pride than thinking highly. Most people look at people who are rich and say, all oh, those people, they are so proud. When the Bible says that he became poor, that we all through his poverty he should become rich. Thinking poor is more prideful than thinking rich. According to the word of God. Because God is rich. How rich is God? He says to be godly is to be like him. So thinking poor is Bible pride. Like, I want that to sing. Thinking sick is Bible pride. Because the Bible says Jesus himself bore how many? Oh, if you can say, you know, I'm so sick. I don't know anybody could help me. It's like you are not thinking according to the measure of faith that is given you. What you are saying is that God lied. God is not true. I know better. 
So humility is to submit yourself to God's word and to begin to see yourself the way God says. If God says you are the head and not the tail, how should you see yourself? How often should you see yourself at the head? What about if you just enter the company and you are the, the, the male boy? What should you see yourself? The head. You are the head male boy. Praise God. And if you see yourself, <laughs> if you see yourself head enough, enough, you discover that you get to the CEO soon. You don't act like just, I'm just an ordinary male boy. No. You do the male boy ship as the top male boy in the whole company. The best they have ever had. That's thinking as the head. You can't, you can't think of yourself less than what God says. And the Bible says you can't think of yourself more than what God says. Real, the, the, so there are two parts of pride. There is inferiority complex is pride. Superiority complex is pride. So God is saying he made us rich, but you can't see yourself better than other people. Because if you see yourself better than other people, you are thinking of yourself how? More highly than you ought to think. Just because you are a billionaire, don't make you better than a beggar on the street. Because Jesus paid for him too. You're just an ordinary man with millions. The beggar is an ordinary man who doesn't know what he has yet. But we are all human beings created in the image and likeness of God. That's why if you treat people better because they are rich, you are proud. If you treat people less because they are poor, you are proud. It's the same spirit. It's the same spirit. And you have to watch it because the natural man wants to treat some people. He, this person has so much. He's so big. Did you see the car he drove? Whoa. That's pride. The same way also, if you look down on a man, you come into the, the, to, to, to a place like this. And you don't greet the potter because you think he's just a potter. That's pride. You treat everybody well. You treat the young and the old. You, you, that's the way God says we ought to think. So he said, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but think soberly as God has given us the measure of faith. If you begin to see yourself the way God says you are, that's humility. And that will make you rich. Somebody say hallelujah. That will protect you from every manner of sickness and disease. That will give you a good life. Even if your husband says, I don't care about you. You say, God, you know you won't give me a husband that does not care about me. Your word says that I will enjoy every day. And you begin to rejoice. What will eventually happen to that husband? He will change. But if you say, the husband says, I don't care. Say, I said it. From the day we got married, I've been seeing you. You have been looking on from the left side of your eye. You, the tendency is that what you are saying will now increase it. Glory to God. I usually say here, if your wife cannot cook, what should you do? Cook for her. Hallelujah. Do women like me for that? <laughs> or, or go and get a cook. You say, don't tell her, you don't cook like my mother. She didn't marry your mother, praise God. <laughs> right? right? I said, right? right? Don't think of yourself more highly than you have to do. If your husband does not make money, what should you do? Make money for him. Amen. Say, you are the head of this house. I will go and get you the, the house, the, the, the car we want to drive. We will drive it. Amen. I will buy it and give you the key. I want to hear the man say amen. amen. <laughs> that is humility. That's, that's Bible humility. I say, look at you. All your, all your mates are buying cars and giving to their, their family members. And you are sitting down and watching it takes, the, it takes a thief. <laughs> if you keep talking like that, what's going to happen? Out of the inward, the picture you are seeing will begin to show up. So even your, if your husband is lazy, go to your smart seat and begin to see him smart. <laughs> Glory to God. You can either walk by sight or you can walk by what? Faith. 2 Corinthians 4, 18. He said, why we look not at the things which are seen? Because the things which are seen are 
temporary, they're subject to change. But we look at the things which are not seen. If you walk by sight, you cannot walk by faith. So you have to take the word of God and make it the picture. Begin to see it. Everything else is saying otherwise. Your children are acting funny, acting straight. Stop looking at them and just treating them the way they are. Go to your active seat. And create new pictures. Treat them the way you want to see them, not the way they're acting right now. You know I'm talking to myself too, right? Glory to God. And I'm practicing this. So the first thing is that you need to get information, study. The second thing is that you need to meditate. The third thing is that you need to begin to speak the word. Let me, ask, let me add one more thing to meditation. One of the things that helps your meditation is also the things you hang around with. We have already mentioned that one of the pillars of wisdom is right association. It's very key. You can't put things around you all the time and it doesn't get inside of you. The Bible says if you hang out with the wise, what's going to happen? You're going to be wise. Wisdom will enter. If you hang out with, with fools, you say you'll come to ruin. If you hang out with people who are always angry, you get angry too. If you hang out with people who are nice, what's, happen- what's going to happen? You begin to act nice. If you want to have a good marriage, look for someone whose marriage is doing well. Hang out with them. If you can't hang out with them physically, talk to them on the phone. Watch their programs. Do something with them. That is how you transform yourself to a new degree of glory. Amen. It will affect the way you speak. It will affect the way you live. So, as I'm rounding up, I believe that many of us, our lives are ready to change. (laughs) By living how? Inside out. Inside out, we create the vision from God's word. And we walk from that vision. You can be as rich as you want. You just first need to create the right imagery. Glory to God. See yourself driving a particular car. Right? What happens after a while? You will be driving, people will see you driving in it. It's not by chance. That's the way faith works all the time. If you can believe it, you can receive it. I'd like you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Father, we give you praise. We give you praise. We worship you. I'd like you to just close your eyes. One minute, if there's an area in your life that there is a challenge, I want you to begin to see the alternative. If you have financial challenges, begin to see yourself rich. See your bills paid off. Maybe every time bills come, you get mad, get offended. See your bills paid off. The bill come and says zero. Maybe you have issues in your marriage. Begin to see a good marriage. See your husband, your spouse, loving you, walking in unity with you. See yourself different. If you are sick, begin to see yourself well. That's the way Jesus ministered to people. He says to the, to the widow, stretch out your hands. Like, see yourself healed. Do what you couldn't do before. If you can see it in your heart, there is power by the measure of faith to change that. But first of all, the Bible says that the heart needs to be changed. If you're here or you're, you're watching online and you have not given your life to Christ, you're not born again, the first thing you need to do is to receive Jesus into your heart. We are all not sinners, and we don't have to be. We, we are all sinners. We are born in sin. But once we are born again, our nature of sin is removed. A new heart is given to us. We can live righteous and holy. But you have to receive it. With all eyes closed, all head bowed, if you're here this morning, and you're not born again, you want to give your life to Christ, just lift up your right hand where you are. I want to pray a very quick prayer with you. And the power of God is going to come into your heart and cause a change. If you're online, you can just lift up your hand where you are and believe God that as we pray, supernatural change will take place. It doesn't matter if you've been in church all your life. You can be born again even after you've been in church for 20 years and you never got born again. All eyes still closed. Father, I thank you for everyone whose hand is raised or who are indicating in their heart right now they want to give their lives to you. I come against the nature of sin, the power of Satan. I say, lose your hand from their lives in the name of Jesus. I say, be delivered from the dominion of darkness. 
I come against the spirit of fear and unbelief. The spirit of the flesh. The spirit of this world. Loose your hand in the name of Jesus. I come against lust. The lust of the flesh. The lust of the eye. The pride of life. Loose your hand in the name of Jesus. I declare a new heart. New spirit. A new attitude. I pray that their mindset, their imagination will begin to produce good according to your word. That their minds will be renewed, be renewed by your word. That your Holy Spirit will, will penetrate into the mind and begin to create visions and dreams that are based on your word. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We thank you that everyone who gives them like themselves to you, no one can take away from you. We declare that their eternal security, their eternal lives are secure in your hand. That their names are written in the book of life. Thank you in the name of Jesus. All eyes stay closed. If you are here and you are sick in any part of your body, the healing power of God is here. He already took away the sickness and the disease. If you can see yourself healed, you can receive your healing. There's no sickness that is too hard. It doesn't matter how long you have had it. All eyes closed. If you're, one, if you're believing God for a miracle of healing in your body or in your mind, you can just lift up for your right hand, put your other hand on your chest, and I'm going to pray with you the prayer of faith. Healing is coming in the name of Jesus. But see yourself healed. See yourself healed. Don't wait to be healed before you see yourself healed. Begin to say things like, I receive my healing. I believe in me. I will never be sick. I'll never have this ailment again. This is the last day. Just like the message we heard. By this time tomorrow was said that everything would have changed. See yourself. By this time tomorrow, no more pain, no more symptoms, no more sickness. If you can see it, if you can believe it, there's nothing that is impossible with God. But I will thank you for your healing anointing. I come against pains. I come against genetic disorders. I come against environmental disorders. Things that were even caused by accidents. I said, be healed in the name of Jesus. Be healed in your head. Brain pain, headaches, migraine headaches, tumors. Be gone in the name of Jesus. Be healed in your neck, stiff neck, pain in the neck. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Be healed in your lungs, your heart. I command high blood pressure. Deformity in the heart. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Lungs be healed. Every form of allergy. Be gone in the name of Jesus. Be healed in your stomach, your intestines. Every growth. Every disorder. In your digestive system. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Be healed in your reproductive organs. Every kind of cancer, every kind of ailment, every kind of malfunction, be gone in the name of Jesus. Be healed in your feet, your ankles, your bones, your toes, your back. Be healed from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. Every nerve that has been damaged, be restored in the name of Jesus. I speak peace that passes human understanding. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise. Just lift up your hand and begin to thank him. There are many miracles happening here this morning. Father, we thank you. We thank you. Somebody had a chest pain when you came in here. And it has been going in and out. And I'm talking about serious chest pain. You're healed right now. You're healed. The pain is gone. The pain is gone. Somebody has been afraid, fear of hypertension. It looks like the blood pressure has been increasing. It's, it's coming back to normal as we pray. It's coming back to normal. The word of God, the Bible says, medication to all our flesh. Yes, you have been receiving medication just sitting here because the word of God is bringing even your blood pressure to normal. See yourself walking in a perfect health. Perfect health. Eyes are being healed. Ears being healed. Even those who are watching online, receive your healing right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Just give him praise. Give him thanks. Come on, rejoice. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Amen. Uh, first of all, we would like to welcome anyone who is coming for the first time. And then after that, we will welcome the family 
uh, of Sister Martina as they give their thanksgiving. Uh, but uh, Ubong and the family will encourage you to come out after that. But first of all, we'd like to know if anyone is worshiping with us on a Sunday morning in Love Foundation Christian Center for the first time. Just wave your hand. I'm not saying if you are worshiping in this hall because you may have worshiped with us somewhere else before. But this is your first time in Love Foundation. Can you just wave your hand? The rest of you, can you put your hands together for the Lord for them? Hallelujah. Amen. We're going to tell you we love you. We're going to give you a gift just for coming. But just get ready. We want to make you specially welcome. And as we sing this song, uh, those, of you, those of us around them, just go and make them, we'll make sure we you know, hug them, shake them, and, and give them a special Love Foundation welcome. And please, uh, after, the, after the, the service, we have special gifts for you. Amen. Are you ready? Let's all stand up on our feet as we welcome them specially. Honey, 